Okay, we'll come to the <coughs> last afternoon session. As I said, I'm Petr Kopáček and I'm coming from České Budovice. It, uh, German name is Budweis and it's uh, really, it's really the, oops. Sorry for that, it will take time. So how to, yeah, it's just, so it's in the middle of Europe. We are a small country, like 10 million, I guess less than Sao Paulo or Rio. And uh, we are in south of uh, Czech, south of Prague. And it's a beer town famous for the real Budweiser. And we have kind of a biology center of Czech Academy of Sciences, which is actually joint campus with uh, uh, Faculty of Sciences of quite recent, quite new University of South Bohemia. So I was inspired by Alas so I put some, some uh, uh, part of my CV. So I graduated from physical chemistry, so doing some electrochemistry on, on dropping mercury electrode. So completely different topics. Uh, then I in, uh, joined this uh, biology center and work in two, uh, two institutes there, entomology and parasitology. And I was mainly, mainly focused on bioanalytical methods like electrophoresis, chromatography of proteins and stuff like that. Important uh, milestone is uh, collapse of the Communist Party, not only in my country, but the whole Eastern Europe. And actually this allowed me to, to make my PhD study, study because the communists wouldn't, uh, they didn't allow to, to make kind of uh, higher education. So after that I, I, I could go out. I went to Uppsala for, for more than half year's day, at, uh, working with Professor Kenneth Sederhell and actually it pretty much determined my next career because I was working on immune system in, in freshwater crayfish interested in um, molecules which, uh, uh, which are important for, uh, for clotting of hemolymph and stuff like that. And uh, based on this, I was able to, to make my PhD, defend my PhD at the Institute of uh, organic chemistry and biochemistry in Prague. Then I, I was happy to get the Alexander von Humboldt Stiftung Fellowship in, in Germany. It's a very good one, by the way, it's still running. So I encourage everyone to, to apply for, it's very prestigious. So I, I was working there on insect, on uh, wax mouse and profenol oxidase, how it uh, start to activate and go to melanization. And Basically, after my return, I started to work on uh, Institute of Parasitology, and I uh, turned my attention to ticks, and I actually work on ticks until these days. In between, I, I visited the famous university uh, of uh, University of Arizona, working with uh, Professor John John Law, who is expert in iron metabolism in insect. And I also have the chance to see in 2006 uh, to visit for a short time Brazil uh, in Sao Paulo, the lab of Serli da Fre, and uh, also shortly uh, Pedro Oliveira here in Rio de Janeiro. So, ticks are not good. So I, I, I like to comp I like to say that they are really our enemy enemies, and we have to fight against them. And I, I also uh, like to compare our mission like, like, like the mission of any good intellectual service. So we are trying to gather all info information which can be used against this enemy. We also have to, have to respect that uh, the enemy is not, not easy. So it's cunning, adaptable, insidious. And we can also learn quite a lot from this. So and my almost cliche, I 
uh, it's uh, saying that we are looking for kind of Achilles heels, which can be uh, which can be hurt and which can be, uh, that can be used to to actually actually find find uh, find uh, vul vulnerable ta targets in tick physiology. So what we are fo focused on is tick gluttony, the uh, incredible uh, capability to ingest more than uh, 100 times their own weight. Then uh, we are focused on him and iron metabolism. Most recently on uh, some, uh, some specific traits in the metabolic pathways. And uh, actually what we started with was tick immunity. So the, here is, uh, I'm sure you uh, saw at this course several uh, variants of this uh, vector host pathogen triangle. So the relationships in between such a triangle can be complicated. And so, as I said, we are, my lab and our interest is mainly on this side of this triangle. And uh, when I go further, I think with another variation I can show. We in our institute, we have several groups which actually cover all sides of, the, of this triangle. So there is a group working on tick-borne pathogens. It's mainly Lyme disease, uh, Borrelia spirochetes, and uh, virus of tick-borne encephalitis. Here is my lab. Molecules important at tick pathogen interface and actually part, it was usually part of my lab, but uh, now they are uh, independent or partially independent is Ondra Hajdušek lab. They are more on tick uh, mechanism of tick, uh, pathogen transmission by tick. Michalis Kocifakis, uh, it's, uh, and his people are very much in in proteins and uh, uh, molecules in a tick saliva, which actually make tick invisible, and they are interested very much in uh, in the whole pharmacy of these these uh, molecules, which uh, suppress uh, pain, which uh, suppress immune response and uh, inflammation. And uh, there is another group at Faculty of Science, and they are <coughs> most focused on the host immune response like like uh, uh, interleukins and inf inflammatory mo molecules in in, uh, in hosts mainly mice as uh, as models part of uh, a little bit uh, what uh, Ala talked about so we cannot think that there will be any universal any universal vaccine or, or preparation against all kind of uh, ticks and all kind of use so so for, for people, it will be really goal to get, get early awareness, uh, awareness of tick bites. So when we can feel uh, uh, itching or we can, like when mosquito bites are, we have hands, which, which are, this is our great advantage, so we can remove it quite, quite easily. And uh, so molecules that can, can actually uh, increase this responsive to, to tick bite would be very, very nice to, uh, for, for preventing most of the tick transmitted diseases. For dogs, I'll also show some, uh, so I believe that for dogs it's maybe some good chemistry and good preparation which will not be, which will be much less toxic to the dogs than to parasites. I very much like the isoxazolines. You do not like this uh, uh, next guard, but it's working very nice in our dog, and he is protected almost one chew tablet for almost for the whole season. So I'm going to use it for 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 cattle. The, uh, the vaccine would be good not only in the very beginning of the of the of the tick, uh, tick bite, but uh, it, it should somehow uh, reduce the, the uh, feeding, development, producing of eggs, and uh, so you have much more, much more chance to, to protect against cattle tick than by vaccine that uh, 
uh, for other uh, three host sticks and for for reservoir animals I, I don't think that there is any any chance to vaccinate any reservoir animals so our not only model but actually this is one of the real rare parasite in my country so we are quite lucky so we have mainly this exodus resinus which transmit Lyme, Lyme disease and tick-borne encephalitis also ehrlichiosis and uh, anaplasmosis uh, but uh, mainly Lyme disease and uh, tick-borne encephalitis is of great concern and even in public media so every season we have uh, tons of messages how many ticks are at so so it has also advantage that we can get money in our grant application to 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 make our research and the the tick is small so uh, we we can use the reverse genomic approach static from gene going for proteins it functions so we will break through was uh, the genome which uh, of Exodus capillaris, which is closely related to this resinus. They are like brothers and brothers. <laughs> uh, most of the genes are almost 100% identical or 95, something like that. So we can really use the, the genome of uh, Exodus capillaris for our work. The first data were not where actually the paper was released like 2016, but the data was uh, data were all available like uh, uh, in uh, December 2008 already. There is a number of good quality tissue transcriptor for, for this species like salivary glands, midgut. And what's important for, for fu functional research that the RNA interference is working quite well. <coughs> and most recently we have now the laboratory transmission model for, for Borrelia and Babesia, and our most recent milestone in, uh, in our research is uh, having uh, artificial membrane feeding of this species. I will talk about later. So this is how our research starts in wood. We call this method flagging. We go with this white textile and try to collect the ticks from grass, so, so having them and then we'll bring it in our laboratory culture. So this, this guy here is probably the most important person in the uh, Budweiss research group, Jan Erhardt, who is taking care of, of the tick colony and he's very good at this. So, so, so he's really, we really need him. Okay, okay sorry. So this is uh, back to the tick glutoni. So this is my colleague Radek Shima. So when he <laughs> feeds like tick, he may looks like this, even maybe more. water transport from uh, from the from the blood meal back back to the back to the host uh, we are the molecules which are uh, named uh, uh, aquaporins so first we uh, when we started to to look at this uh, uh, some of our colleague uh, put into the uh, gene bank something uh, she called hemoglobinase. So we saw, wow, how?
how they look on electron microscopy. So here is kind of a, a detail, a detail of these. So the blood comes into the gut lumen. From some species, it, it makes nice hemoglobin crystals. So it's still nice example of a crystallization. And uh, these, uh, these uh, red blood cells are made here in Rio de Janeiro, in Pedro Oliveira lab, and the uh, main, main uh, scientist behind is uh, Flavio Lara. So I recommend to, to read his paper, it's very elegant work. And the hemoglobin digestion, it's uh, inside this cell, it's an uh, acidic process, so it occurs something, it, This is an uh, um, uh, inhibitor for legumine, so it almost doesn't, doesn't inhibit uh, the whole hemoglobin. And we, we, when we put all together, it's completely blocked. So using this, we can dissect actually how the hemoglobin is cleaved. So it, start, it starts with this uh, aspartic peptidase of catepsin D type. the antimicrobial activity in the mid-gut and what they got was the hemoglobin fragment so when I saw the results for, for the first time I couldn't believe that but uh, it was uh, it was uh, very much confirmed and basically the similar things are like the hemo uh, hemoglobin fragments I, I guess it's, it's called hemocidines are working like antibacterial
an acidic uh, catepsinus very much uh, evolutionary somehow uh, somehow conserved but uh, uh, I guess by by the access of oxygen it uh, turned completely to, to serine peptidase machinery which you, you can find in mosquitoes and Functional genomics based on RNAi, actually it wor worked nice in that uh, we can silence these peptidase, but it revealed that probably uh, targeting one of those will not be the, the goal we need because there is great redundancy. So we can, when we silence uh, the catepsin L by 95%, Albumin goes to the to the small one, but the digestive machinery is almost the same. Same. There is one exception that probably the catepsin D is not involved in the very beginning of albumin uh, albumin lysis. So here is actually uh, over. we have to act here at the very beginning of the feeding. Most of the research we done on, uh, on the hemoglobinolytic and albuminolytic machinery was done with this so-called 
semi semi engorged uh -huh. semi engorged dicks just uh, mainly expressed mainly during the feeding phase, dropping down, and uh, then uh, catepsin uh, activity goes up again, and uh, mainly behind is this catepsin L3 isoform, which is expressed lately. So we have now antibodies which can recognize both these, and we can see this. So there are known some, some factors, uh, mating factors from males, which may, may trigger this, uh, this activation or the whole uh, digestive system and the reproduction. So, but still, uh, there, is, uh, not, uh, there is a lot of to do to, to understand this more. So now I, I come to the to the heme and iron metabolism. So I already mentioned that we were able to to get uh, hemoglobin and uh, f sorry full blood fat and serum fat ticks. So when I saw this for the first time, so I asked what the hemoglobin is actually good for for ticks. And uh, even before, uh, in 1997, I, I spent some time uh, uh, with John Law at, uh, in Arizona, and he asked me this simple question, what, what do ticks do with all that amount of iron? So when you imagine uh, in one milliliter of blood which, which is ingested uh, by, by a single tick female, that they receive uh, like 100 milligrams of hemoglobin out of it, it goes like six milligrams of heme, half milligram of iron. And uh, if you imagine that the uh, unfed ticks wait for two milligrams only, so that's a really good question how it can 
deals with uh, su such excess not not to be killed by oxidative stress so first uh, i start uh, uh, in arizona working on this uh, so we got ferritin which is uh, actually we all have uh, heavy chain type ferritin which works like intracellular storage protein for excess of iron but later on uh, this guy Ondra Hajdušek found that uh, ticks possess another type of ferritin, uh, ferritin 2, which is secreted, which uh, it's produced mainly in the gut and it's secreted to the to the tick plasma. So back to the ferritin one, uh, it works like iron storage protein. It's uh, very much it's regulated uh, by interesting mechanism of. Uh, of iron regulatory protein, which in a, when uh, it's uh, enzyme of two function, when there's uh, enough of iron in the in the uh, in the system, it becomes active cis, uh, uh, cytoplasmic aconitase. When it's low amount of iron, it uh, it's inactive aconitase, but it binds like iron responsive uh, to iron responsive element of five prime. Uh, message of ferritin one and actually uh, stop its production and uh, taking uh, the uh, s uh, iron from, from from the circulation. So when we when we silence the iron uh, responsive protein, we can see that uh, there is high increase of ferritin one. In a, I think it was done in salivary glands. The function of ferritin 2 is different, so it's uh, secreted to the to the hemolymph, and when we silence this uh, this ferritin 2, we saw that <coughs> actually the amount on ferritin 1, which is uh, which sells like the indicator of iron levels in uh, in cells, goes goes down. So out of this, we concluded that this protein ferritin 2 works like a, like a Iron transporter in uh, <coughs> uh, uh, in between the, the tick uh, from from tick gut to uh, peripheral tissues of tick, and shortly uh, this is the famous most famous cow I guess sorry everybody uses this <laughs> I don't know who made this picture yeah yeah uh, and. So, so when we saw the uh, the characters of this ferritin, we were quite excited because it possesses all the attributes we would like to 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 see for good can candidate uh, antigen candidate. So, it uh, it uh, performs some critical. It has some critical function in tick physiology. It limits reproduction and development. This kind of protein is not present in a host, so mammals and uh, no, uh, nobody like this uh, have uh, this kind of ferritin. So it's uh, so it's uh, very much promising that they will not uh, make any uh, 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 any negative response in the host. It's uh, there is only single gene for this protein, so it's not like the salivary gland. Salivary gland multigene families. When you target one, and there is uh, 50 of other proteins which you do basically the same. It was enough immunogenetic. It was, yeah. Also, it's uh, important that it's expressed in the gut, so so the antibody imbibed by ticks go go to direct contact with this. And there, there was some hope which we were not able actually to prove that it may also pro protect somehow or prevent pathogen transmission. So we did some preliminary vaccination trials. One was done in Mexico. It was even published. It was with Jose de la Fuente. It was kind of promising. Here you see what you, what you ask about the equation. So the parameters, you know, for, for the number of tick, tick weight, uh, oviposition, and uh, hatching of larvae, and then out of the they are able to calculate the efficacy. I, it's still all, all, always kind of mystery for me. 
the result of this paper or this uh, experiment was that it was uh, actually almost comparable at least for for micro plus like uh, comparable to bm86 uh, we got some project uh, quite expensive to to repeat that uh, in mexico in uni university of heretaro this uh, with uh, this guy okay. Juan. Juan Masquera. I'm sorry I'm, I'm, scler I'm sclerotic for, for uh, names and uh, just for, uh, from my head so, so we made this uh, uh, on two variants of the ferritin 2 using BM86 as a positive control advanced as negative control so 20 cows were involved Here you can see Uria, he was helping us. Here you can see me uh, with the buckets full of ticks. And uh, I have to say that uh, the, this trial was not that uh, successful or not that, prom we could see some effect on, on uh, number of eggs and uh, hatching of larvae using the ferritin and its variants, but we failed showing anything for so-called positive control BM86. We still don't know whether antigen was bad or wasn't so, so actually we have no, no chance how to interpret our results because BM86 provided by Jose was not, not working. And the last chance, uh, uh, there is a consortium named CATVAC, Catletic Vaccine. It's uh, led by, by health setters and uh, the idea for this consortium is uh, using one uh, one facility in Morocco to test in the s under the same conditions different vaccine which people say they might be protective so it's running just now here you can see Allah I think behind here is Petr Vladsen is him yeah, I cannot yeah 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 Juan Mosqueda, now I remember. <laughs> Jose de la Fuente. Yeah. Yeah, Pateiro from Brazil. Yeah, Cristina Maritz Olivier from South Africa. This is Manuel working with Ala in, uh, in uh, Australia. Bob Miller from, from Texas. And yeah, Glenn shows. Yeah, yeah, all right. Thank you. Thank you. So, so actually, it's uh, now. Now it's uh, in the process. There should be some some other evaluation. I do not expect much. Did you get any any response from Theo? Yeah. 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 It was oh, okay. Yeah, he sent me that they, they may see some statistic, uh, positive statistic for combination of 13-2 with BM86, but I'm, you know, how skeptical I am. Yeah. So, so it's actually the first, the first uh, occasion how to test different things in one system, and I think whatever the information will come out will be very useful. Okay, so that... Uh, and now I go to the question of hemoglobin. So, as I told when I saw this, I asked what, whether ticks even need hemoglobin. i show you later, soon, maybe next slide. Okay, not, not the next slide. So, so the results coming from uh, here, from, uh, again from Pedro's lab. In, uh, it was based on, on uh, enzymatic assays and from, from the, from the uh, tick genome. The uh, results clearly show that ticks are not capable to, of, uh, of uh, hem biosynthesis. Sorry for it. 
So they lack all these uh, all these uh, five five enzymes, uh, cytoplasmatic enzymes, even this uh, this first one, and they only retain these three three uh, three mitochondrial enzymes, and uh, even more uh, ticks are also not capable of him him uh, cleavage, which is quite quite rare among among animals. But still, ticks need a lot, uh, or quite a lot of him for for or uh, for making their our hem hemoprotein. So like cytochromes, cat uh, uh, catalase, dual oxidase. So so they do need him. So where they got it, they get get it from the host blood. And here is the answer to your question. So. We found that serum fat ticks are capable to, to lay almost the same amount of white eggs. And there was only one exception or wa one thing, that these eggs were dead. And uh, if there was really low amount of hemoglobin in the, in the diet, so there were no larvae coming out. Yeah. How can do? How can you can you do this on the membrane as well? Uh huh. So you. Uh huh. That, that for, for sure there should be for full engorgement there should be some other components of the of the of the, of the blood. Uh, the On membrane. Uh, uh, I, I show you. I show you may, maybe uh, later. I guess I have some slides from membrane feeding. I hope in this presentation. <laughs> Uh, and this is actually a result which was not very encouraging for us because we can see that we add small amount of of uh, heme into the blood diet. There is a risk of larva hitching, so it means that if we if we suppress the the heme uptake by 99 percent, they will still still produce uh, living eggs. So, so it's. Uh, it's not very much promising for other intervention. I mean, this uh, to trying to do any anything with the heme uptake or synthesis. What we clearly see here that when we fed on uh, on uh, either on full blood or serum, that uh, the amount of pathogenins was was, amount, uh, was the same. Here, here are the uh, guts and digest cells from from blood fat and uh, serum fat ticks, and you can see that uh, from the serum, of course, no, no, he is an ov in ovaries. And there was the other question: what what transfers the the heme to the to ovaries and eggs? So in ticks, there are there is a group of uh, highly similar proteins. They are called the Either uh, helps like for hem binding lipoglycoproteins, also first described here in Brazil, or some people call it carrier proteins, and there are very much similar proteins uh, named telogenins, which actually produce uh, are precursors of yolk proteins, and the only actually you cannot recognize them well by sequence, but you have to see their expression profile. So for vitellogenin, you, you clearly see that they are expressed only in mated, mated females. And uh, yeah, so the, these, uh, 
uh, thing, yeah. So this helps the, it actually uh, transport him in all stages to, to peripheral tissues including males, but uh, vitrogen means uh, transport him to ovaries in, uh, in mated females. We, we showed that by, by silencing of uh, these individual individual genes. So we can see mainly, it looks like that mainly the vitrogen in one is uh, that the protein which is responsible for him binding and, and uh, transport to ovaries. And uh, as I mentioned, the uh, ticks do not have heme oxygenase, so the question is what is source of the iron? When they cannot cleave him and get the iron out of him, so, so what is the source? So this experiment showed us that uh, actually uh, both uh, uh, blood and uh, serum fat uh, ticks, they have similar amount of iron. Here is shown by, by the expression of ferritin one, like the, like monitor the iron levels. Here is shown by atomic elemental analysis. And uh, this simple experiment, when when we uh, actually supplemented serum with uh, transferrin, oh sorry, showed us that uh, probably the serum transferrin is the source of iron for for tick because when we added this, we can see clearly. Higher, higher level of uh, iron based on, on ferritin detection. So we believe that the serum, uh, that the iron source for tick metabolisms is uh, serum transferrin. So here is uh, the scheme how we so far understand human iron metabolism. So I try to uh, summarize it briefly. So. Hemoglobin goes to the, to the large hemosomes, probably we are the hem hemoglobin receptor. Uh, other serum proteins go to the small, small, uh, small uh, endosomes, uh, and uh, then, uh, then uh, most of the heme goes to the. Sorry, I said hemosomes. No, e endosomes or digestive vesicles. Most of the uh, heme which comes from the cleaved hemoglobin goes uh, the, is detoxified uh, via, uh, to, the, to these hemosomes, to these aggregates, and the transport involved is kind of ABC uh, type uh, uh, transporter. I show later there is also in him uh, a scavenging from from circulation or from the from the intracellular scavenging. It's involved one type of glutathione as transferase, and then then the him which is supposed to to go to the is bound to to help the carrier protein and goes to the all tissues, but the him which is supposed to go to the ovaries is bound to the uh, vitellogenins and go to the ovaries. And now I, I will uh, mention, uh, briefly mention the in vitro feeding. So it's our new tool we now, f we now use for different kind of experiments. So it was not invented by us, but mainly by these two guys, this Thomas Kreber and, and uh, Patrick Guerin at the University of Neuchâtel. So they presented it first in uh, tick and tick-borne uh, pathogen uh, uh, conference 2005. So they found how to make the membrane, uh, how to how to make the the perfume to to send the membrane. So it's kind of a bovine hair extracted. I I call it cowboy perfume because it smells like her. And yeah, they, they succeeded to 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 feed the. Exodus to full engorgement, and we we did uh, first. I sent there uh, Jan Perner to learn this technique, and uh, he now another student, uh, Matej Kuchera. He even uh, 
make some more progress. So, so he found other materials which will be permeable and uh, and can be used even for small larvae and and nymphs. So he got this uh, this uh, efficiency to to feed larvae and nymphs using different kind of uh, uh, membranes. And uh, using that, he is able to to actually to make the whole whole thick developmental cycle on the membrane. And this platform allowed us to, to make uh, and design with, uh, in cooperation with uh, 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 José Ribeiro at the NIH, uh, interesting uh, experiment. So this one was focused on salivary, uh, salivary glands and the question was behind how the uh, salivary gland transcriptome, so-called cialums, differ when thick feet on the, on the natural, on the living animal, a, a rabbit, or on on a, on a artificial system when you have actually deactivated serum, supplemented with red blood cells. So we we wanted to see the molecules which are really upregulated by the active immune system. So we didn't, to our surprise, we didn't found that many, but somewhere uh, still enough interesting. So there were like anti-complement proteins, which makes sense because uh, mammalian complement is actually the, one of the main, main uh, immune responses to, to the tick bite. There is a highly upregulated group of uh, so-called uh, basic tail superfamily proteins. So, to my knowledge, nobody knows exactly what this uh, quite uh, uh, quite uh, uh, huge family of proteins uh, makes in tick. So, it will be very s interesting to f further st uh, study their function. There is a bunch of metal proteases upregulated in a, in active uh, immune system. So. This experiment also revealed, because it was done on uh, individual individual libraries from individual ticks, so for, for many, many of uh, multigen families, it also revealed great inter-individual variation. So we can see the, like uh, there is, a, we for instance look at a protein which is named SOP15, uh, people say that it's responsible for or very much involved in a uh, transmission of Lyme disease. So we can clearly see that uh, there is like six, six or seven of these sub 15s and we can see clear differences. One tick produces another not. So so this is something I would never I would never rely on that to make vaccine or any, any uh, intervention against this because uh, it can work in one tick and it will not work in others. So, so it was also kind of surprising result from this. Yeah, here is just to be confirmed the expression by QRT of these, uh, of these uh, transcripts. And another experiment also done uh, uh, with uh, Jose Ribeiro uh, based on a uh, membrane feeding, we also ask what what genes are upregulated when when ticks get get him or hemoglobin. So so we compare just simply uh, midgut transcriptome from from blood and serum fat ticks at two time intervals, uh, like three days and fully fully engorged. Against using the the individual individual libraries from sibling ticks, actually uh, uh, progeny of one one female. And again, there was quite few few proteins which were clearly upregulated by the presence of hemoglobin. One of this was this guy. This uh, I already mentioned. This is the. Uh, glutathione is transferase of a uh, delta or epsilon class and ticks, they, they have a whole bunch of glutathione S transferase 
transferases like uh, maybe 40 for, for scapularis or sinus. But this one, it's uh, clearly uh, represented only once this type in all tick species we look at. So, so there is really great, speci uh, great specificity of this for for him binding, we, we were able to show that it's uh, inducible by him, it binds him. So, so it's clearly, uh, unfortunately, again, uh, the silencing, uh, successful silencing of this GSD, they, it didn't uh, produce any, any, any phenotype we, uh, we would like to see, like a tick wouldn't survive also. So it's, they have also, so some way how to how to avoid its loss and most recently now we are interested what's actually uh, other things are necessary in a, in a the diet and also we can play around uh, with artificial feeding and focus on uh, on uh, molecules which are involved in a, in a nutrient uptake like uptake of lipids, cholesterol. Uh, currently we are working on also on insulin and uh, TOR signaling pathway. There is uh, interesting targets in uh, amino acids like uh, these tRNA synthetase. They, they, uh, they have wonderful phenotype when, I when they are silenced by RNAi. So this is the portfolio we are now working on. Use, uh, uh, in frame of uh, our current project. And I don't know how, how much time I have and how much I bother you. There is uh, one, one more part about the tick immunity. How long? I think like 20 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so this is the, actually what I, I started to work when I came in 96 to, to, to the lab working on ticks. So I was interested, coming from insect science, I was interested. First question I asked, do ticks has, uh, have a profanol oxidase system? So we tried to, to play around with hemolymph and that time we used the classic classic approach. So we had this African uh, soft tick and uh, it was kind of model tick so using this we can get enough hemolymph to, to make kind of fractionation look for the protein activity and uh, by chromatography we got we got isolated proteins then we got uh, partial amino acid sequence out, out of this. We got degenerate PCR primers and finally we <laughs> We resulted in a full genome sequence. It, it was quite laborious, but uh, in uh, in late nineties, it it was uh, actually the the way how to how to get some results. So with this Ornithodor smovata, we we got uh, mainly three three immune enzymes. One one was lysozyme from the mid gut contents. There is clear uh, antibacterial activity against a gram positive bacteria in the gut. So it was kind of tricky to isolate this enzyme because uh, putting the gut contents on any column, you will damage it. So there should be kind of affinity step before, which was uh, like uh, affinity, uh, affinity binding on, on uh, hitting particles. Uh, following the, uh, sorry, following the hemoglutination activity of the hemolymph, we got uh, electin, which turned out to be very much similar to, to Limulus tachylectin uh, 5A and 5B. And uh, when I tried to get profenol oxidase, I didn't get profenol oxidase, but I get this, this uh, protein, which turned out to be actually the alpha-2M microglobulin, which is the 
few ester protein which works like the universal universal inhibitor of of proteases circulating in uh, in a sera of mammals and uh, uh, most of other anim mammals and other animals so when we came to 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 the uh, to the uh, exodus resinos we use this already the reverse genomic approach to get the same molecule this uh, alpha 2 microglobin from from uh, resinos and that time we were very much uh, inspired on and uh, uh, looking further for theoester proteins because uh, there was uh, nice uh, nice work uh, done by Elena Levashina in Jill Hoffman, uh, the Nobel Prize winner, uh, lab in uh, Strasbourg, and they showed that the mosquito theoester protein is uh, an complement-like protein. It's uh, involved in uh, in uh, transmission of uh, all kinates. So, so it was uh, there was a bunch of very nice papers. So we continue to to be interested in uh, tick complement molecules and. Uh, by knowledge of the tick genome, we found that ticks actually have uh, all classes of uh, theoester proteins known in vertebrates. So they involve three alpha two macroglobulins, these uh, protease inhibitors. They they have three uh, uh, comp complement C uh, three type complement molecules. This kind. They have one one molecule very much related to this mosquito mosquito uh, uh, tap one, and uh, there is another group which is now called MCR, like for for macroglobulin complement related. So so there are actually four groups of proteins in uh, ticks. Uh, I think uh, we found all these nine nine orthologs also in Exodus ricinus. This is from scapularities, and uh, also f looking for for the lectins uh, and uh, gene coding for this. Uh, I forgot to say that the lectin actually belongs to the fibrino fibrinogen related protein. So there is also a group of uh, lectins now named exoderines. And the group of exoderin A is actually this one, which is involved in uh, in hemagglutination of uh, of uh, red blood cells in RSA. Other complement-like molecules, I will go uh, fast through this. It's uh, the convertases, which actually cleave the cleave the C31 to the active active. Uh, uh, molecule. So one of is related to the either C2 or BF factor from the from the mammalian complement system. So it's a molecule like this, or there is similar molecule which is called factor C. It's not. This is not complement molecule. This is the first uh, first serine protease which is involved in. A Hemolymph clotting in uh, in uh, limus. I don't know if you are aware of the of the essay for endotoxins based on the limulus amebocytes clotting. So it's very sensitive essay. How to show that uh, you have in your solution that there are some endotoxins from bacteria. So it's uh, so it's the first uh, is the first uh, serine protease quite complicated in the cascades which triggers all the cascade leading to the to the hemolymph clotting so it's very much uh, uh, very much uh, related to this oh, sorry and we found uh, that uh, even though we didn't see in uh, in ticks any clotting because we don't have any good assay for this uh, this this uh, factor C is uh, responsive to injury, so it's not responsive to, to microbes, but it's clearly when we inject anything, so we, uh, we think it may do something with the wound, uh, with the, yeah, 
when the vendor tickets injured. And to, yeah, we try to <coughs> somehow to see how these complement-like molecules are involved in uh, bacteria phagocytosis by Tig hemocyte. So we performed uh, this uh, uh, RNAi silencing of these individual components of the complement-like uh, proteins. Allow the ticks feed on, on the guinea pigs then take the hemolymph and make in vitro assay and put the bacteria into the assay and show how the phagocytosis of of uh, the, the microbes is uh, involved when these uh, uh, individual molecules are missing. So here is the summary of what we got. So for <coughs> we used uh, uh, this chrysobacterium endogenes, which is interesting because it's a uh, uh, gram-negative uh, bacteria, which is highly toxic to, to tick. It's uh, infection with this, uh, the, the ticks do not survive, and it's really pathogenic to, to... We believe that it's because it produces quite potent metalloprotease, and uh, that the... Uh, and also, also that it was... It was found that when we uh, silence these uh, metal pro uh, these uh, protease inhibitors, alpha two macroglobulins, and uh, so so the phagocytosis of uh, Chrysobacterium goes down. So the theory is that somehow the uh, uh, when uh, when these inhibitors are missing, so so phagocytosis is not capable to to remove these uh, pathogens. And uh, this was done for all other molecules, so we are now working mainly on these C3, C3 molecules and, and trying to see how they are involved in, uh, in uh, Borrelia transmission. Actually, it was, it was recently done, and we found that, sorry for that, that none of these molecules seems to be really involved in Borrelia transmission. So it was based on this uh, this uh, transmission model we have for now for Exodus ricinus and the European uh, the European most important strain of Borrelia, which is Borrelia ocelli. So uh, Radek Shima and uh, this girl they they they. Uh, made quite quite reliable and robust a robust system for for this transmission and uh, this is uh, the experiment just we show that uh, either silencing of any of these proteins doesn't have much much effect on on uh, infection of the mice uh, most important and most recent result now is uh, uh, done by this transmission model is it was published quite quite recently no, not this one but so for <coughs> I should that there was a, for Borrelia transmission it's believed and now it's uh, that uh, people say that uh, it goes via salivary road so nymph gets infected uh, uh, a larva gets infected, it molds to nymph, which, uh, which uh, then feeds on, on the host, and Borrelia goes through the gut to the hemolymph, into the salivary glands, and then infect the host. To be honest, not many people really saw some, some, uh, some uh, Borrelia in salivary glands, and we tried to address this problem somehow, so uh, Radek and uh, they, they did experiments, so they, they found when they, they looked uh, on the infection of mice, so they looked, uh, they found that uh, mice are clearly infected after two days of tick attachment. Did, did, this is very much uh, what they have for uh, scapularis, so, so it takes some time.